black. Obviously, I don't wear anything that's not black. It, that's kind of like a hard, that's kind of like a hard question. It really depends on duct tape. No, I'm kidding. Um, I like this, Sarah Landry. You're giving us more than we asked for. And you know what? That's what, that, you know, but I'll be here all week. I'm I really not. do love a hard consonant. Love, love a good consonant. Creamers, welcome to Get Creamy, the show where we dissect and dive deep into the minds of creative people who do cool things. Today, we're in a black room. Why? Because we are interviewing the queen of black, Miss Sarah Landry. Dark techno producer, techno producer, DJ extraordinaire. She is a multifaceted talent and woman. Let's go and dive straight in. Sarah, how are you doing today? I'm good. How are you? I'm great. Oh, good. I'm tired still. I did. I did. Um, I did stream. On Twitch this weekend on Saturday, played for four and a half hours. Tell me about that. Warehouse. This is this is your Clubhouse series. Clubhouse series, yeah, which is originally like a warehouse event series that I started throwing in Austin when we lost a couple of nightlife clubs. I started just I was kind of like, eh, fuck it, I'll do it myself, and started running warehouses and throwing these like legit underground European style true techno raves. Mm -hmm. And then obviously when COVID hit with everything like that, we obviously can't throw in-person events, but I have um, some friends of mine that are like production geniuses that have been in the game for like like 20 fucking years, all of them. Eric Fink, um, Dan Barrett's on lighting, Freck Brassbinning, who is our video guy or VJ, and then Kagan Meager. And they built a like basically a festival grade stage with an led wall in a warehouse and so i've been doing like a four plus hour techno stream with like their full effects like visuals lights all that and so i did one on saturday and i'm tired still but they're all so sick we're filming this on tuesday guys tuesday. <laughs> yeah, so, so this is this is three days later I'm and still tired she's still, still tired. tired well it's like it's like running a marathon doing one of those right because i'm like up and moving for four and a half hours and so i'll burn like three thousand calories in one of those and oh, my back it. hurts because i'm like Apple jumping watch? i do yeah <laughs> <laughs> I usually you can actually see it on the stream like i'll be there and i'll like like whenever i get like texts or anything comes through like it comes in on the watch so i'll just be like <laughs> just like check in I'll be like oh. you know it's funny like it looks like I'm like checking the time but really it's like somebody wants me and so I'm like <laughs> but yeah um so those are they're fun but like I don't know man my knees and back hurt after like and uh so whenever we finish I'll be like Ugh. but um I don't know I need to get like a anti-gravity mat or something because I'm just jumping on concrete for four and a half hours oh, that's, and, that could be rough yeah. yeah it hurts my joints are like you should stop that you should knock it off. But they're really cool. They, it's always worth it. Um, they always turn out so sick. Something tells me you're not going to stop jumping up and down behind a DJ booth. No, it's it's a completely involuntary activity. Um, it's like, it just kind of like happens because I'm just kind of plugged in and like going for it, right? Uh -huh. And so just like moving and grooving. And I don't even realize what I'm doing until I like see it after. And then I'm like, okay. So a lot of uh, DJs, they, you know, are are doing these sets that are like one hours, two hours. What goes into playing a four hour set or like a, or a four and a half hour set? How do you prepare for that when you're doing these events quite regularly? And I know that you like to make every single one its own. Yeah. I mean, I play, I, I don't like playing for less than three hours just cause it, I can't, you know, like it takes a while to kind of get into it for me. Like it takes me like 30 minutes to kind of start to flow an hour to be like in the zone. So if I have to stop in an hour, that's basically just like musical blue balls. Like, what am I supposed to do with that? <laughs> Nobody loves that. So two hours is like good, but I prefer three hours because then I can really kind of start in one place and take the crowd somewhere else. But I love the four hour sets. I couldn't do a four hour set Thursday, Friday and Saturday. Like sure. while touring, I probably have to max out at three hours. Uh -huh. um, but the four hour sets are great. The main thing with those is I just have to have more music. So I just spend more money on music going into it. I have to have more music ready to go. Like I played like 79 tracks at the one on Saturday. So I'll play like 80 tracks or something like wow. that. So I just have to make sure that I have enough music, which I always do, but it's about like digging and finding enough new stuff that it's not the same set every time. Right. Um, do you find that you do that more for yourself or for the 
the, the consumers? Like, do you want to keep yourself entertained or? I just like to do different things. Like I yeah. like everything. Like I, I don't like to play the same set more than once because that feels boring, right? Like it feels boring. And plus like every, especially with the live streams, which are cool because I have that production behind me. I have the, because everybody that's working there is in flow with me. Like we're all in flow doing our things together, right? Like the lighting guys, the lighting and visuals aren't predetermined or preset. It's like, they're like me. They have a library of like sounds and visuals and options. And mm -hmm. then as I'm playing and doing my stuff, they're playing and doing their stuff too. And it's funny, they have controllers that are kind of like this to control the lights <laughs> yeah. in the video, right? So right. it's the same deal. So it's different every single time, but I always like to have, um, fresh music and new stuff, whether it's my new stuff, whether it's unreleased stuff from friends, whether it's like weird, deep industrial techno that I found who who knows where, right? Bandcamp or whatever. Mm -hmm. Just always have like a new stuff so that each set has a distinctly different flavor. And since I've been doing these, we started doing these in April, kind of right after my craft tech release came out when I was still kind of making like more big room style techno. Mm -hmm. And I got spent six weeks alone and was like, fuck it, industrial. So I started making industrial <laughs> like a couple years ahead of schedule, a couple years ahead of when I planned to start kind of moving to darker stuff. And so since we started, the the sets have gotten progressively faster and darker since we started just a little bit each time. Like, <laughs> like, like I think when we started, I started them like I started using your audience in. Yeah, exactly. I started when we the first one we did, I started at like 132 BPM finished like in the 140s. On Saturday, and I would bump it up a little fast. But on Saturday, we started at like one thirty-eight, right? And so, like, they're just—they've just been getting, diff like, progressively more industrial, which is great. That's what I like. But I had to, you know, I don't want to like clobber anybody over the head if they're like expecting me to play my craft tech release. Like now, <laughs> nobody expects that anymore because they know I'm doing something different. But um, do, do you they're feel, all different. Do you feel like you're? Uh like training your followers into becoming fans of, of, of your new stuff or yeah. like, I mean, or like, I, like educating them in a way? I, yeah, I think it's kind of, I think, um, I mean, I don't, training is an interesting way to put it. I think it's more kind of like preparing people and letting them know what they can expect to hear. Right. Like my, my, the style of stuff that I've released has like gotten faster and like a little bit weirder, more ravey industrial, even like in the last couple months compared to like, what came out in like April, mm -hmm. like that's, that's very different. And so, and I've been doing this for a while with like my parties, which is why I like the, the clubhouse party, the four hour, five hour kind of set. Right. Cause I can, mm -hmm. what I used to do with them is I would play more like drum Cody type stuff for a while. And then slowly we'd get kind of into the weirder, darker stuff. And then as the time has gone on, the weirder, darker stuff is now like more of it. And it's gotten faster as like my style has gotten faster. So anybody who knows now, they know kind of where we end up, which is that like hardcore, heavy, burgine possession, yeah. industrial shit that I just absolutely love, right? But like, I never, like, it's it's so funny. One of my friends, I think you've met Clarissa. You met Clarissa, uh -huh. right? So she she runs a concert Instagram and it's so funny because I had sent her to Dax J in um, San Diego for Cross, which is like the last thing that happened before everything shut down. And I sent her and I was like, dude, you need to go see Dax J. Jack, Dax J is fucking awesome. He's a super sick techno producer. Mm -hmm. And I forgot to tell her that he's like an industrial techno producer, which means he does like the 145, like crazy European, German, ravey shit, yeah. right? The stuff I'm doing now. And I forgot to tell her. And so she was not emotionally prepared for that. And she went in there and she was like all scared. She's like, oh my God, right? <laughs> and it's funny because... Like I would never go into a set like that, like playing that like from the jump. Like we always start... A little like you have to kind of foreplay it, gotta ease everybody into it. You can't just like dive straight in. You yeah. gotta start slow and kind of work your way up, right? And so that's kind of why I like having that time structure and everything. So I'll start in a place that's slower and chiller than I wanna end up. Uh -huh. And so that's why that you kinda four, have to. Yeah, right? totally. That's good DJing, right? Yeah. And so everybody <laughs> in the chat by by the book. By the book, what you're supposed to do, yeah. <laughs> know what you're supposed to do. <laughs> it's a journey, right? So you got to start somewhere and end somewhere else. Um, um, and so yeah, so it's kind of this whole thing where I don't know. I like to be able to kind of tell a story in a way. And this last one that we did on Saturday, which was August first, and it's up on my Twitch and on my YouTube. So it's the August first one. I really like because I, you know, it's just like industrial start to finish, but it's a really cool sort of um it's a cool ascent the whole time like it's a four four and a half hour set but like 
you know, I start somewhere and we end somewhere completely different, but it's like a very smooth transition to get there. Like there's no kind of weirdness or anything like that. It's like, you know, do, do we you, just kind of Do go. you do any things like uh, harmonic mixing or, or? I do. I'm a psycho about that. Complete psycho. Um, just going up the scale of fifths or? I don't, I don't go up the scale of fifths. I do tend to move in like um, one degree, three degrees or five degrees typically, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or from major or minor. Like I hate, like there's nothing that will cause me more physical pain than off key mixing or like <laughs> dis like, Oh, like, Oh, <laughs> tor torturous, torturous. Anytime I've heard something where somebody has like, like not, not me, obviously, cause I'm psycho, but like, where it's like another DJ has tried to like pop an acapella over something and they're not in the right key. It's like, physically painful like fit i'm like no stop like i i can so actually that's actually one thing i'm very proud of you if you listen to my sets you will never hear anything that does not sonically match because i am very <laughs> particular about doing that like super that's specific a, that's amazing yeah. and i like to move in fifths i really do like to move in the fifths so if i'm like okay fifths or thirds right so if we're like in g sharp minor that's one i am like okay okay cool we can do like 10 a um, four I, see, A, see, F that's, minor. See, that's, that's we the, can go that's to how six I know A. It. Yeah, all I, I, know, I know. I know the clock. There's a there's a there's a clock. Who who invented this clock? The it's the, the Camelot wheel. It's the the Camelot wheel of fifths. And uh, when I first started learning music, Tiesto was the sort of like big guy, and they talked about him and his harmonic mixing from like left to right, all or all, I don't, all the way up. I don't this is where I first. This is where I first learned it. How did you learn about it? Um, I think I learned about it because I was like cleaning stuff up in record box, right? But I don't, see, it's funny, like I don't do it in it, like I don't have to move in a specific way. I just like, my ear prefers to move in either one scale degree in a, a third or a fifth. Like that's just kind of how I like to do it, uh -huh. right? So like that's just what I think works in general, right? So like a, like a, a minor to a C minor, which is an 8A to a 5A works. Mm -hmm. 4A to a 9A, which is F minor to E minor, 9A to 4A. Like all of those will kind of work. Cause again, it's like a fifth apart or a third apart or something like that. And so um, there's a lot of people who don't give a shit about that. And I think that's, you know, if it works for them, that's great. That is not my philosophy. I am literally, my brain is literally too nuts to, to not think about that. Like I, I can't, like the thought of something being dissonant would literally break me. So I can't. <laughs> Like if, I don't know if, the, if any foreign governments ever need to get information out of me, that is the way to do it. You heard it here first because I cannot stand, I can't, like it drives me nuts. It's something in my, it's, it's something in my brain. But anytime the other thing is like a train wreck or like a gallop, you know, if you hear like a full on bad transition gallop, I'm like, no, stop. <laughs> oh, oh, I hate it. So yeah, no. So I am very particular about the way that I mix stuff just in kind of like moving around in a specific way. Yeah. Just cause. Tell me about, um, tell me about how you prepared or what happened in your cream on top set. Oh, um, so my cream on top set was like, we filmed that like two days after I had done my previous warehouse party set or so like you were stream So st you were still exhausted? I was definitely tired. It was hot also. But like, I <sighs> see the nice thing about that is I had already about had- About 106 guys. <laughs> yeah, it was hot. I was dressing probably in this exact outfit. So um, it was, I already had my crates from that party that I had just done. And when I have like four hours of music already kind of like, you know, grouped into crates based on how intense it is, I can just be like, okay, we're just going to take this, this, you know, and just kind of dump selections of that into new crates. Mm -hmm. So I was just kind of like, it was so fresh what I had just done that I was like, cool, I can just kind of go back and pick some things that were worked here and then add some new things and do all that. So I just kind of drove over there and you know, was made to stand directly in the sun by you. Um, and then we just, it's true. I, I, love, was, I love, I love my it's job. It's true. It's true. I, it's all, it's all for you guys. It's true. It's it true. had, to, it had to look good. I it's wanted true. to make sure, I wanted to make sure you looked good. My friends were like, why didn't you go the opposite way? I was like, I don't know. He wanted the light on me a certain way. And I was like, okay, fine. But yeah, I know we had, we were supposed to start an hour before we actually started. And I don't know if it was like, me asking you to reconfigure the speakers or just like you being nice and like waiting until it got colder but it was so hot oh my god it was so hot well we're 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 in this in this sort of 
pandemic mode. And so we wanted to throw like kind of like a socially distant party. And which we did, which was we, great. We did. We did very, very good. good job of doing that. It we was had, awesome. We had 12 people, 12 people, ample, free, open air. But, yeah. but when you only invite 12 people, the, the, the 12 people kind of showed up a little bit. <laughs> Yeah, we well, kind of waited for there at least to be six or seven people in the audience to start. I think we started once everybody was there. It just, I think I think everybody underestimates like how far out we were because we were like we were in the burbs. Yeah. In the wilderness, basically. So it was I think it's further than people realize. Um, but I'm glad we I'm glad we kind of started when we did start because it was what there was only like an hour of sun on me before. Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh my God, cause that was it was hot. It was real hot. As soon as it went went down, I know you haven't seen the finished product yet, um, but it, you looked like awesome. You looked really cool, very European. <laughs> yeah, it was. It, it that was a fun. That was a really fun time, um, and it it really it worked out perfectly because I like didn't really invite anybody. Like I forgot to like invite people since I had like had a bunch of shit going on, and uh. so then you were like, how many people won? Like three people? You said like three different uh, groups we, of peeps. Yeah, we told three people. Three, three different people groups they of could peeps. Come, yeah. And uh, the people who ended up coming were like people that I know, like fans of mine, like three or four separate different groups of like fans of mine that I know from the scene here. Yeah. And so we had like a really good like diverse little crew of people that are like super into the techno and like OG fans of mine that were down to kind of go from like the more relaxed stuff that we started with to kind of get everybody yeah. feeling it to like all the way to like the heavy industrial stuff, which I did, even though it was like a weekday in a residential neighborhood. So <laughs> nobody complained. Nobody complained. We didn't, we didn't get kicked out. We the didn't. cops didn't show did, up. Wait, were those, weren't those kids there? Didn't we just like score like the most epic pool party for like a bunch of teenage oh, boys? Oh yeah. Just when, ruin their lives. Oh yeah. There was, there was this pool at this, this sort of pavilion, never has anybody at it. But on the day that we chose to, to do some stuff, there was like 12 year olds and 10 year olds and 13 year olds Ch like and children. six year olds. And Sarah's just like, should I just start going? Should we scare them off? <laughs> yeah. Should I play some really dark techno? I'm like, no, nah, let's ease into the let's, let's ease into give the them neighborhood. A yeah, give them a second, yeah. They, it seems like they were down with it though, cause they were like hanging out. Um, I remember Amy saying that she and her friend were like back there to prevent the young children from coming up into the shot because they're obviously underage, right? And we yeah. had everybody there that was kind of chilling and, you know, having a couple seltzers and moving and grooving and all that stuff. So, yeah. So tell me about your obsession with 90s music. What obsession with 90s music? Oh, um, I mean, <laughs> I mean... I don't know. Well, that was like the decade I grew up in. Like I was born in 93. Like my mom's really big into music. My mom's... So it's so weird. My mom's like super big into like 90s hip hop, 90s and early 2000s hip hop and R&B. And then obviously I was kind of getting into music at that time. So I have like all these weird fond childhood memories of like 90s hip hop, pop and R&B and then early 2000s stuff. Like when I had like hit clips, big TBT for any 90s kids that what's are a, like. What's a hit clip? Ugh, weak. Okay, so there were these things <laughs> called hit clips, and it was like something they sold at a toy store, and it was basically like a mini SD, and it was like 30 seconds of like an in sync song, and you could like put it in your ear. I'm dead serious. This is a real thing. There's going to be people that know what I'm talking about here. So I don't know. I just like all that stuff. And then my dad has always been like super into like Queen and Tears for Fears and like new wave 80s type of stuff. And so it's really like that stuff that I, those are the influences I got from like my parents and so I don't know I just like stuff like that I always have like stuff like that would, would you consider it like a guilty pleasure as a techno no producer? I enjoy it I think I think I I don't know I think it's important to kind of have the perspective of different types of genres when you're making any type of music right like things that inspire you that maybe aren't just techno or things that you like that maybe aren't just techno just because there's so much um, breadth and diversity really that exists in music in general and there's so many places where you can kind of get influences from mm -hmm. and so I don't know I've always listened to that I've always been super into that stuff like on the low and so I have like <laughs> I have these moments where I listen to stuff like that and I really like it and then every so often like I mean like I know like when I go to my dad's at Thanksgiving or Christmas his older sister is the one who always hosts like Thanksgiving and Christmas and like the second all of us get drunk right like out comes like the Michael Jackson 90s tour DVDs and like the entire family except my you know the men who don't have rhythm right we'll just get up and we'll all just be like 
straight up, you know, just like throwback playlist. Everybody's drunk and just loving it. There's like a German Shepherd head mask that comes out at some points. It's it's crazy. But it's all these like kind of shared experiences around this music that we used to listen to when we were younger. Like my cousins and I used to listen to Backstreet Boys and NSYNC at her house and like get all dressed up and you know, child, <laughs> childhood memory stuff, childhood memory stuff. Very important. Very important. Does any does any of that music make its way into your pr- productions these days or what's sort of some of I mean, every so often I played one of my friends in England made made an industrial flip of Kia's My Neck, My Back. And so I played that on Saturday and that absolutely wrecked. And it was awesome. You know, like I think like a well done edit or something weird like that is always fun, like something recognizable, like just something weird out of left field. And I'd love to include like at least one thing like that per set where it's just like, what is this sample? I do that a lot when I produce and stuff. Also, I try to put like weird shit in there mm-hmm. that you like maybe wouldn't expect. And so I like to have like at least one or two like surprise tracks a set that's just kind of like a weird flip or sample or something that you wouldn't expect to hear normally. Yeah. And um, I don't know. I think it's important to kind of keep everybody guessing. So what's uh, what are your influences right now? What are you doing inside of Ableton? What's tell me about that? Uh, so I'm making a lot. I mean, I'm making a lot of like crazy, creepy, weird industrial shit, right? Like I like, I mean, my life was forever and irreparably altered when I went to Burgain in 2017, right? As is basically the origin story for like every single bitch in techno, right? Like, <laughs> you know what I mean? It's what is, what's the superhero? Like, it's like the superhero origin story for like, Every everybody in techno is like, I went to Burgoyne and nothing was ever the same, right? And so um, I'm kind of doing stuff that's that's kind of like that, like 145 B- BPM, weird, heavy, industrial, glitchy, kind of crazy stuff. Um, and it's been really fun. It's kind of like my journey, and you can really hear it kind of like listening to like my past releases and stuff, right? Like I started releasing when I was like two or three years into, about three years into production. And I don't like any of my old shit because nobody ever does like the old shit, right? That's not their current style. But you can really hear like the difference and like the growth and the change that's happened for me as a producer, like as my skill sets have increased, right? Like going from this stuff that was kind of like this weird progressive type techno that I did on my Mousetrap EP and then more into this like main room drum Cody craft techie style that I got my craft techie EP. And now, you know, I spent six weeks by myself and I was like, industrial and so now i'm just making a bunch of stuff like that and it's kind of like this crazy evolution of you know my sound design skills my audio engineering skills because the industrial stuff's harder to make than normal techno because you have like a lot more distortion and then eq engineering to kind of get everything to fit together and sound good so it's kind of this journey but um i've just been making a lot of glitchy weird stuff i like what perk tracks is doing obviously perk is super talented great ear for talent great producer so mm-hmm. i have a couple friends one of my friends um runs a label called crisis of man out of la and um i've been working on some stuff with him which has been really cool and then a couple other things kind of targeted at like various european industrial type labels just this like sound that you hear a lot at like Bergine and possession which is a big warehouse style rave kind mm-hmm. of like what i do but bigger in paris which is fucking sick so sick um and so yeah just making this kind of weird heavy ravey 90s creepy shit and it's been a lot of fun to do stuff that's not really big in america right now and just kind of a be able to provide that through the clubhouse and the twitch streams and all the stuff i've been doing there but also kind of like have this like different more european flavor of techno and bring it to the u.s um, you know, we're, we're, in a, we're in a pandemic. You're in a- really? <laughs> this is the first I'm hearing about this. <laughs> you're, an Amer- you're an American DJ who specializes in what would primarily be consumed in, 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 Europe. in Europe. Yeah. What, like, what sort of strategies are, are you using or what are you hoping to, to do? Are you, are you, do you want to go to Europe and and try to, you know, bust through the ranks there? Or do you want to make the ranks here in America and then go over to Europe or so, kind of all of, like mix it all up or what's, so your, what's my, your idea? So the strategy that my team and I have, right? I mean, there's so much of this in Europe, right? There's 
a lot of it in Europe. It's cool. You know, um, there's not really a lot of it in the US. Mm -hmm. And I already have, you know, what this thing that I've established here with what I'm already doing. Um, and I have friends here. And so I've, you know, I obviously I, I have thought very seriously about fucking cleaning out my bank accounts and bouncing this authoritarian regime. But we are literally <laughs> not allowed to do that right now. I am literally trapped here. So even if the plan was not for me to do this, I'd still be stuck here. But I, I do want to go to Europe eventually. I absolutely love Europe. Every time I go to Europe, I get like depressed the last three days in there since I know I have to come back. Um, I love Europe. Um, I 100% want to go and move. I just, I like everything about it. Literally the weather, the way the cities are designed, how tall the men are. Like, it's all great. We love it. How late the parties go. Like, it's all perfect. It's great. It's totally ideal for me as a weird um, techno vampire. But um, for me, it's staying here. I think there's not that kind of techno. Those types of parties are so awesome and cool and epic. And the US just hasn't, been that cool in the past and it's getting there right like i think you're seeing like all these these big djs i mean you're seeing like the amelie lens and charlotte's and everybody else but there's also this kind of like cool industrial wave that we're starting to see pop up like 6am group in la is a promoter collective that does throw like a lot of really sick industrial events i'm obviously doing my industrial events here in austin texas um, basement club in New York, which is a, like a super Bergani type of club in Queens is booking like some really sweet industrial talent, Rebecca, Shlomo, all these, uh, people that are like, you know, the best of the best and playing like the coolest shit in Europe. And so, um, I really do want to be one of the people that is create something like that, or is a big, big name creating a movement or a scene like that here in the U S cause it just doesn't, it's not here and it's so cool. Yeah. And especially like when you see the streams, right? And you see like what happens when you put like the American style production behind it, how absolutely <laughs> sick it can be. Epic. It's it's dope, right? Definitely and, check out the Clubhouse streams. They they're are They're nuts. They're a complete madness. And it's really fun to kind of do that. And so um I've really been focused on kind of, you know, building that here in the US and creating something different and giving Americans kind of a taste of like this techno experience that you per previously were mostly getting in Europe, right? Because yeah. like the, the I mean, the main type of techno that's kind of been here really in the last few years is like the drum code stuff, which is like very much a different vibe. Mm -hmm. And then Sion runs a label in LA called Octopus and they still, they do really cool stuff. The people, the homies that run that are awesome. They're in LA and Arizona and they're great, but they do kind of like a slower type of vibe. Mm -hmm. Um which is dope and I love it for like certain parts of the night and stuff, but like there's not a ton of like crazy industrial shit here. And so I'm like, oh, guess we're gonna do that, you know, just yeah. cause I wanna create that authentic European experience having done it so many times Absolutely. and, you know, had to, you know, roll into the airport at Schiphol, like hanging by a thread or whatever. I'm like, Americans deserve this experience. We just deserve to see like the real big leagues cool shit. And so I don't know, I'm trying to, do my own thing here and then eventually I'll have to move to Europe for touring and everything like that. So I'll do that, but I'll probably be splitting my time kind of like summers in Europe and winters in the U S tell me about, uh, tell me about Coachella. Um, I'm booked for Coachella. Um, oh, I mean, I cannot begin to describe, you know, the level and frequency of like mild to moderate mental breakdowns that I had when all of this shit started. Cause like they closed everything. Like they canceled South by Southwest like two weeks before I was supposed to be South by Southwest and like four weeks before I was supposed to be playing Coachella. So I was like ready. I had been doing like Pilates for six months. <laughs> I had spent like a bunch of money on PR. I was like emotionally prepared and plague. And I was like, son of a bitch. And um, obviously that's all a nightmare. Um, all that shit's rescheduled for 2021. Um with um, all those logistics of Coachella. I still have no idea what's gonna happen. Last I heard, I am still playing. So I'm sure the chips will fall where they may. My new agent will take care of all that shit. Um, so. Red Rocks? Red Rocks is rescheduled for September, 2021. I'm playing with Rez at Red Rocks. Mm -hmm. That's gonna be fun. Um, that should be good. Uh, I don't know if anybody's ever played like hardcore industrial at Red Rocks, so. Yeah, do you have any extra VIP passes? No, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> they give you so, everybody asks me, they give me, they give, you d really don't get very many, especially if you have like your team coming with you. Yeah. Like they'll give you like three. And if I have my agent and my manager coming with me, right, then there's one left. 
right? For a photographer, it's, like it's you insane. have to give your own photographer like a pass. Same with Coachella. Like I like any of the passes that I get, they go straight to team members, right? Because you have to have and anybody that's coming with you has to have like a full on full access pass or they're like not allowed in your trailer and shit. Like it's uh. like a full like they 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 keep that shit real tight because you can't just have like a bunch of random people running around. Yeah, it's true. So it's yeah, true. so Red Rocks and then Brooklyn Mirage was rescheduled for where I'm also playing with Rez was rescheduled for July of 2021. Talk to me about witchcraft. Ooh, um, <laughs> legally I'm not allowed to. Um, the Wiccan, the Wiccan, le- 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 what? The Wiccan Council has told me I'm not allowed to share any secrets with you. You specifically, I can't tell you anything. Are you They've, kidding me? Are, 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 are you kidding me? They've I been have been waiting huh? for past life crimes. I've been waiting since I came here during during the quarantine, and I found out that you're into witchcraft. To interview you, I booked a show with you just so that the interview would make sense. Also, that I can ask you one question, and that question was, "Tell me, t- talk to me about witchcraft." And I mean, what do you want to know? Because I mean, I feel like tell as, me, I, I don't know. Tell me how you're associated to it. Tell me, I practice it. Tell or like what it means to you, or I mean, it's a set of like divine feminine spiritual practices that are focused on you know natural earthly cycles. It's a living, breathing, growing pagan religion that's rooted in. Um, rituals practices and spirituality that's been around for thousands of years and so that's really kind of what it is i'm not a fan of the book religions i'm just you know clearly not that bitch Um, (laughs) you know um i didn't have to go to catholic school but i'm sure i would have tormented many a nun if i had to um and so yeah it's um it's kind of it's a spiritual practice i do a lot of tarot stuff i do a lot of energy work and energy healing i do a lot of moon ceremonies and moon rituals and occasional spell work and stuff like that it's really kind of like a close personal set of religious and spiritual practices do you, do you put in a per, like practice every day or is it no like it's, a weekly thing it, monthly? it kind of depends on what i'm doing right like if it's like tarot stuff then that depends if it's like um i guess prayer uh, isn't maybe the right word but like any type of like kind of like energy work or meditation like that's more of a daily thing it really kind of depends on how i'm feeling and what's happening cosmically what's happening with the planet what's happening with like the global energy field all of these things it really kind of depends and varies um but the thing i like about the thing i like about wiccan wiccanism really uh the wiccan school of thought is the whole principle behind it, right, is uh, deity reaches each individual person in the way that they are best able to understand and connect with it. And so it's a very unobtrusive belief system, right? And it's works well, I think, for women because um, it's very much closely tied into the cycles of the moon, which like menstruating women are obviously also very closely tied into like moon cycles and natural 28 day cycles with the way that our bodies work and hormones and all those things. So it's historically always been kind of this like feminine practice of communicating and connecting with other women and holding space and sharing all of that. And that's something that I think I really enjoy a lot. Some of my best friends I've met kind of through yoga studios and, you know, basically witchcraft really. And so um, we all kind of have all these practices together. And so it's a good thing for me. Do you have any cool spells that you've done or has like, have you, have you done a spell to like get a job or have you, done a spell to send somebody away or any, um, any spell story? Nothing I can talk about act specifically. Actually, actually, <laughs> that's a lie. Yes, I can. Um, so I actually don't do anything that hurts other people um, by um, like intentional design. I don't do any dark magic at all because it's kind of like, I don't know. I'm of the opinion that like um, higher spiritual energies, um, in whatever name or form you refer to them as are very much an intense type of power that we don't understand and cannot control. Right. And so I think it's never a bad idea. It's never a good idea to be somebody who doesn't know what the fuck they're doing, what the fuck they're talking about with any spiritual training to be working with dark energy. Cause you're just inviting dark energy into your life. And um, my friends that are kind of like higher level priests and stuff like that will be like, like, if you ask for something from dark, darker energies and darker spirits, they are going to ask you to do things in return. And it's very hard once you invite that energy in to kind of get it back out of your life. So I tend to kind of work more in the realm of light work. But I actually had something I was in a very terrible job. And I won't say who I was employed by. But like those of you who know, know. 
I was um, in a terrible job last year that I absolutely fucking hated. Um, and it's funny, I was reading a book by Gabby Bernstein, who I really like. And I was on the way to ADE, where I was going to be for like 10 days doing techno shit. Uh, I was so excited. And so, so I, I met was, you. Yes, that is where we met. Right. Yes, yeah. yeah, so that's where we met. Okay, yeah. So I was on my way to ADE, and I was reading this book by Gabby Bernstein called Super Attractor, which is a great book. Um, and I was reading it, and I was so fucking miserable at my job. And anytime I would kind of leave my corporate job and go, you know, do put on my like full time musical artist hat. Right. And do these events where I was like, you know, my job wasn't doing whatever bullshit I was doing. It was doing techno stuff. Right. And anytime I would come back, I'd just be like, fuck, because I always hated kind of going back to, you know, like normal corporate bullshit, which has never been my jam. Mm -hmm. And so I was on the flight on the way to ADE. And I asked, I was like, universe, please send me a creative income solution that allows me to quit my job and do music full time. So I went to ADE, forgot I said something, went to ADE, had a blast, came back. 20 days after I had said that on my flight out there, I was laid off with severance and six months of unemployment. You won the war. Totally. Yeah. Now things are dicey because there's a plague, but whatever, it's fine. I'm still... <laughs> a plague or a pandemic? It's, I feel like that's kind of the same. It's close. It's just largely the same thing. Okay. Um, I say plague for humor's sense because I don't think pandemic is a word people take seriously anymore. Um, it's prob probably a little bit overused a little bit. So It's um, sensationalized by our American government. The, don't even open that can of worms or you, we'll never get out of here. Don't, you don't want me saying anything about the American government or you guys will never leave. <laughs> All right, so we're, we're not going to say anything about the we're American government. We're not talking government. about the American government. No politics. Oh. I, we're getting dangerous. I'm, you, we need to change the subject real quick. No, but so that was kind of an example of where I had been like, hey, I need help. I hate this. Please get me out. And then they were like laid off. And I was like, yes. <laughs> it was the funniest thing because they had pulled me down and they were like, your job position has been eliminated. And I was like, oh, no. <laughs> <I was laughs> That's like, great. I was like, oh, I'm so upset right now. <laughs> right. Um, so that was kind of one. That was really one moment for me that kind of was a moment where I was like, oh, this is all very super, super legit, cool, right? And then uh, it was, it's crazy because right after I had asked for that, it was like three or four weeks after that happened that I got booked for Coachella and I was like, cool. And then it was like a couple weeks after that that I got booked for Red Rocks and Brooklyn Mirage. And so it was kind of like all this crazy stuff. And then- When space opens up in your life. Yeah, right. Nature- New, new thing, and nature naturally just puts new things in. Yeah, nature abhors a vacuum. Vacuums physically don't exist in the universe. There's no such thing as empty space, right? Whenever there's empty space or emptiness, something new fills it in, right? And if yeah. you're somebody like, I don't know, our cups, there's only so much space in your cup for liquid, right? And so if you're sitting there just trying to drink, you know, a cup full of straight tequila, right? There's no <laughs> room for any mixer. So you got to dump some tequila out in order to be able to fit some ice and mixer in, right? And so there's only so much room in any of our lives for a certain amount of things. And so when you cut out things that maybe aren't in your best interest or serve you the best, then that allows space for new things that maybe do serve you better to kind of come into your life and put you further on that path to your highest good. And that's very much what I do is this is all for my highest good. And so yeah, that's kind of, I guess, a general overview that's not super crazy. Like, we're not going to do anything here. Like, there's, like, I don't know what you're expecting, but if you were expecting me to, like, whip out, like, a small woodland creature and sacrifice it in a, pe in a pentagram, that's not, that's you, you know, a sore you know, misrepresentation. You know, Sarah, when, when you, did, like, agreed to do this <laughs> interview, I really, you know, I was hoping you'd maybe, like, pull out a card or two or something. I can pull out a card. We can pull out a card. Oh if wait, you want. no. Last time you, last time Sarah pulled out my card, she pulled out some real. Well, no, I pulled out some real good cards. No, I was a no. I'm anybody who understands. Last time I did a reading for him, this one got like death, like immediately, which <laughs> upside down death, which I don't even know. Upside reverse death. Reverse death. Yeah, like, parts of you are which, dying, and which new means things super need life. To I don't know. No, no, no. It means parts of you are dying, and you need to do some serious internal work to realign on your current path. That's do, we, what that do, means. do you feel that my current path? Do you feel like since you've done that reading, that my current path is like I elevated? have no idea what's happening on your current path, and so that's a question that's entirely up to you. It's not my job to lead you through. <laughs> your own spiritual growth that is your job fair enough i just tell you you need to do the work it's up to you if you decide to do it okay okay so via the instagram you guys have asked sarah landry a few questions we have eximia 
D. I apologize if 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 I say oh, that wrong. Oh, that might be Jimena. Jimena X I. Yeah, Jimena. Hi, Jimena. Jimena D. What's your dream location to play on? Oh, that's going to be a hard tie between Burgine and Possession. Those are going to be the main. Those are those are two of my big bucket list gigs. Burgine and Possession. Aside from like all the festivals, but those two are big ones that I just I can't wait to be booked to play those events. <laughs> Cabria Music asks you, what kind of kicks do you use to start to make a heavy kick? Um, so ooh, that's kind of like a multi-pronged question. It, by heavy kick, I assume he means industrial kick. And what that is, is you need to kind of have the right kick to begin with, like the right type of kick in terms of like intensity and um, tone and crunch. But the key with any like the key with any industrial stuff, and this is a joke that I make, but it is 100% accurate. Like I say it, and I'm being funny, but it is the exact truth. I promise, right? Like if you're trying to make industrial techno, you just take whatever you normally do for normal techno and add like 10 BPM and five layers of distortion and trim all your reverb tails, and then that'll kind of get you where you want to go. So with the heavy kicks, you need like a lot of well controlled distortion and crunch to kind of give it that like mean type of snap. Um, and I'm actually kind of working on a drum course right now that I'll be selling through my website that kind of teaches people using Ableton how to kind of process drums in that way for techno. So keep your eye out for that. Keep your eye on the lookout for that. Gus Deshuda asks you, did you ever think you'd be making techno right now? Um, I don't know. I mean, I was into different shit when I first started this and I kind of had no idea where I would end up. Um, like I think I started learning how to DJ using like Deep House like in 2013 because that was just like I had been listening to like a lot of Above and Beyond at the time and then Great DJs. Love they're awesome. They're great. They've created some really incredible musical concepts. And then I think they played a track. They played a track called excommunication by Urka and one of the AGBT radio shows. And I was like, ooh, what's this? And then I kind of like nosedived deep into Deep House. And from there, kind of as my skill sets deepened and as my taste changed, right, which was as I got better as a producer, better as a sound designer, better as an audio engineer, better as a DJ, my taste kind of naturally gravitated towards, the, you know, the dark, creepy shit, which is very surprising, I'm sure, to everybody who's watching this. Um, and so... I kind of just ended up there. Um, and it really happened kind of, again, right as my skill sets as a producer were ready for that, right? Because techno is very advanced type of production because it's a lot of like space design, spatial design, audio Absolutely. engineering. You know a little bit about it. It's, it's super. It's very complex. Very complex, very heavy on the sound design, very heavy on the audio engineering. And so I kind of got into that right when my personal skill sets as a producer were ready for that. It's definitely the nerdiest form of dance house music in, in general like you i would say techno and dnb i think are dnb is yeah dnb is also are equally they're they're de heavily detailed the, neurotic the, 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 yeah the production group the people who make and the people oh, big who audio enjoy yeah, yeah they're audio nerds same with techno dnb drum yeah, and bass big if, audio if you nerds, know what we're talking like about yeah anybody most of the people any like all my homies that are like hardcore audio people and techno like every like most of them have like a euro rack right like it's like the people who are like you know serious sound nerds that are like into it right and it's the people that are really good right like and i have some friends that are that are fucking awesome selective response who's great who's my friend in la who has that industrial label that's absolutely sick you know um perk with perk tracks is incredible super technical joe far another one super technical mastering engineer yeah. you know what i mean weba another one who weba doesn't really do industrial right now he's more drum code but his stuff is like incredibly awesome detailed work and he and i became friends because we were nerding out when we were playing the same gig together mm -hmm. and like but again it's like all these elite nerds elite nerdery is like a lot of what techno is right and there's some people that aren't like that but most of the people that have been in the game for like a while that are like super crazy into it are all big audio engineering nerds because it's really complex um and so yeah it's funny though one of my friends who i was friends with when i started djing i had kind of gotten into this and he's in new york so i haven't seen him in a while but he was like I always knew from the start that you would be doing this kind of shit eventually. And I was like, really? <laughs> Interesting. Um, 
which makes total sense. Like it's totally my personality. Like I've always been like a dark and creepy bitch. And so it works for me. I love this kind of stuff. I love this like intense, punishing, pounding, relentless type of sound. Um, it's fun. It's really fun to make. It's even more fun to play. And so I don't know. It's but just a very good fit. You went to school for something entirely different. I did. I am not a, so this actually, so moment of inspiration. I am not a classically trained musician. I am not somebody who went to music school at all. And I am not somebody who went to production school instead of college or anything like that. I went to NYU and I have a degree in finance, psychology, and advertising. My thesis was called The Psychology of Capitalism. That is literally what I studied in college. And the entire time I was in college, I was in all the nightclubs in New York because like, I am most motivated by subfrequencies, like overall in life. Subfrequencies and carbohydrates are like my two big motivators in life. And so, <laughs> and so like um, I found my way into all the clubs and then eventually I was like, I can do this and started DJing. But um, yeah, I am not somebody who was classically trained as a musician. My mom's a classically trained concert pianist, but she could never get me to sit still enough to have that like classical music theory training. Um, my ear's very good. So I don't know how much that plays into it, probably a lot, but um, I don't have any classic classic musical training at all. If you're interested in doing this, you don't need that. You just have to be able to hear what sounds good and be willing to learn a lot of sound physics and be frustrated for a couple years on the front end. And that's really all that's required. Oh, and like money to buy some stuff, usually. You have some pretty toys here? I do have some, I have, yes, I do have some very pretty toys here. Lots of toys. Tell us what you're working with. I have my push. I got my, this is my baby, my sound card. Ooh, the Apogee. Whoa, that's the big one. Symphony I.O. Yeah, that thing's great. It's Whoa. crystal clear. Notice I have this that I bought first. So now this is just a very expensive plug-in box. It's just the, daisy the, chained. I have the same one, yeah. To this, yeah. So I still use this and it's just daisy chained to this. So I have this. I have a Sub 37 over here. I have a Behringer Neutron behind you here. Um, so yeah, all kinds of shit over here. So toys, lots of toys. But I this is... My baby. I love that. That thing sounds great. She's pretty. She is. She sounds really good. She love that really thing. Nice. Yeah, it's great. I should have gotten the one that has like more ins and outs. Um, but I'll just I'm hoping that, you know, one day soon I'll be famous and they'll just like either give me one or give me a discount. So we'll see what happens. Fair enough. Okay. Apogee. So Apogee. Apogee. If you're listening, you need to get with Sarah Landry. I need or her. if or any anyone that's that's listening uh, that has some hardware sarah landry could, I will, could you use some i will happily yes i will happily test out your gear it's funny i actually have a good relationship with the team at ableton um like they're they're artist relations people and i have a good relationship and so they're actually preparing to have me talk on like a webinar about like the ways in which i use ableton and how i use like certain things and the ways that i make music using the program and stuff like that so I anybody think be great at that I am. Thank you. I am very good at that because I like it a lot and I can talk about it intelligently, succinctly, and also emotionally enough that it doesn't sound as boring as it could potentially sound, which is key because it really is, again, elite nerdery, all of this. And so, um, yeah, anybody, if you want me to test your stuff or talk about it, I will do it. And up Sarah Landry. I got a lot of open rack space over here, so... <laughs> lots of lots of free rack space. Dangerous, dangerous music. Hit me up. Dangerous music. SSL. I want that fusion. Hit me up. What is your favorite word? Word. Oh God. Uh, do, do, is there a subcategory of word? Not yet. Just what's your favorite word? Uh, I, um. Ooh, I mean, I mean, the first things that come to mind are really like fuck and cunt are like two ones that I really do enjoy, particularly mainly because of like the hard consonants. But um, <laughs> I don't know, like aside from I really that, do love a hard consonant. Love, love a good consonant word. I don't even know. Like, uh, I mean, I have a phrase that I used a lot at NYU that just never has escaped my life, which is this is social construct is a big phrase that we use a lot now. Um, I don't know for words though, I, I, I guess fuck, maybe it's a good one. What's your least favorite word? Moist. <laughs> <laughs> I knew immediately. <laughs> Nobody likes that word. I don't like it. It makes me uncomfortable. Okay. Well, the next question is what's your favorite curse word? Fuck and or cunt. Fuck and or cunt. Although cunt, I don't think counts in Australia. So let's go with fuck. I like this, Sarah Landry. You're giving us more than we asked for. And you know what? That's what, you know, I'll be here all week. 
What turns you on? Like intellectually? I'm going to go silence. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't know. Um, <laughs> I don't, it, that's kind of like a hard. That's kind of like a hard question. It really depends on duct tape. No, I'm kidding. Um, it really depends. <laughs> um, it really depends on. Um, I don't know. I think it's kind of like an energy thing. I, it's so weird. Like I'm such a chronic workaholic now that like I do a better job of keeping myself kind of entertained and engaged generally than like anybody else could. So I'm never like out like looking for people it really relationships for me like in general like friendships or otherwise are very much like an energetic type of thing like if i don't know like if, if i vibe with somebody i vibe with somebody and that's kind of like really the, the furthest it goes so i don't know i guess like um i do have a history of dating audio engineers so i guess people that are into the same shit that i'm into i tend to like that like like likes like yeah yeah, well, it's just like something to talk about. Like, I've also dated people since I've been into this that like aren't into this. And it's it's hard, right? Because they just they don't understand the level of like, commitment, love and to a certain degree neurosis that mm -hmm. really has to be present in order to be successful in this business, right? And so it's kind of like hard to now and plus, like, they never want to hear me talk about this kind of shit, which is like a challenge, because that's all I ever want to talk about. So like, I like uh, hanging out with other people and like meeting other people that like the same stuff as me. Even like just on a friendship level, like just being able to nerd out. But um, what turns you off? Turquoise shorts. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, uh, white men. No, I'm also kidding. Uh, further joking. Uh, Republicans. Just kidding. Uh, no, I'm not. Um, I guess um, I think close mindedness, really, like. Um, thinking, you know, everything, being unwilling to learn new things, being, being unwilling to admit that maybe you're wrong or misinformed, um, being like fiercely, staunchly dedicated to a belief system that like, and not being open to like a different alternative side, I guess just, um, yeah, closed mindedness, I think in general, like judging people when you see them, not wanting to learn new things, not wanting to try new different things. Not wanting to give things or people a chance if you have like a preconceived notion about them. That's something that I think is very challenging to navigate. Um, obviously, racism is another big turn off. Like anything hateful, I'm mm -hmm. like, nah, right? Of course. But um, aside from like all of the givens, which is like, you know, people who are dicks, um, I guess it would be the unwillingness to expand and learn and grow, which I think is super important. What trend do you love? Trend? Like, in what sense? I, I haven't defined the word. <laughs> <laughs> Webster's Dictionary defines trend as, no. Um, what trend do I love? I mean, I really, so I like seeing in the music industry, I like seeing um, the, how many young female perspectives we have mm -hmm. on a varying, on like a variety of different genres of music. Um, I like that women are getting the chance to, to share their interpretations and tell their stories. I like that a lot. Um, that's, and I don't think it's a trend. I think it's just like the walls of sexism being broken down. Um, trends, I love the chunky sneakers, provided they're mostly black. I like chunky sneakers. I'm here for the cargo pants. Um, okay. I'm gra but like again, a tailored cargo pants. A tailored, a tailored cargo, cargo pants. Pant. And black, preferably. Black, obviously. I don't wear anything that's not black. Um, let's see. Trends, 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 trends. Trends. Um, okay, we'll, mo we'll move to the next question. What trend do you hate? Trends I hate. Um, I don't. Let's see. Uh, I'm really sick of like. People who create content for YouTube that think they're celebrities. That shit's annoying. Um, everybody photoshopping their shit into oblivion is super annoying. And I think it's really damaging for young women. Um, I think, let's see. Um, there's something else and I'm trying to think of what it is. I don't like brown lipstick. I think it makes your mouth look like a butthole. Is I that, will die is, on this. Is hill. that a trend? It was. I don't know if it still is. I don't pay attention, but I hate when people put on like matte brown lipstick. Like on certain skin tones, it looks good, but I'm just like, why? I don't like lipstick, and I aren't friends right now, though, so I don't really do any lipstick. So maybe I'm biased, but I don't know. I don't like super cakey makeup anymore. I like. I'm. I don't, I don't need it either. 
Yeah, I know. You look great. Um, <laughs> oh, thank you, Sarah. You look so great. <laughs> Finally, a compliment. Well, after one hour. Yeah, and you know what? I'm, you know, I'm not being paid to compliment you, okay? <laughs> okay. All right. All right. Um, I'll cut the direct deposit off. I mean, I'm trying to, like, trends. I mean, I hate... I hate how people don't mix their snares right. Actually, everybody in techno is doing this thing where they overcompress their hi hats, and I can't tell if it's because everybody's deaf or because they're trying to get them to stick out in the mix and they just don't know how to do it. But stop it! You're gonna deafen yourself and deafen everybody else. Telephone Tel Aviv was like, "All you techno producers are fucking deaf. Why are your hi hats so loud?" So I hate that also. So stop it. What comes to mind when you hear the phrase "cream on top"? Um. Oh God. I mean. We've had this conversation before, I feel like. But uh, we haven't. That's true. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, I forgot you weren't here uh, for our previous conversation. Um, I mean, <laughs> internet. I, internet. <laughs> Welcome. No, um, I guess, I guess, I mean, we've talked about the concept of the cream rising to the top, right? Like when you're, what is it? When you're like making butter or something, there's just like a layer of fat on top and you have to skim it off before you can drink. That's the cream. What's, what's Or the you can drink it, it mix it back in. Yeah. So I guess that, um, the notion of things of lighter density rising to the top, I guess would be the technical term. Um, I guess now you, since you've been wearing, you have so many t-shirts to say cream on top now. Oh. It's like, that's one of like 90 that he has. I'm not even kidding. Hold you. on, hold on, hold on. Okay, so Sarah, I'm going to give you two choices. Okay. You already know what I'm going to say here. You get to choose <laughs> from a t-shirt that matches mine, uh huh, but with some sleeves and the gray and purple cream on top t-shirt. Thank you. Oh, you want to be my matchy friend, huh? Uh, no, it's not. It has nothing to do with you at all. It's um, it's the fact that this is black. So, look at that. <laughs> Cute. We love it. I'm gonna crop it though. You can do whatever you like with it. Yeah. Great, because that's what I'm gonna do anyway. I've been really diligent with my fabric scissors. Bought a pair of fabric scissors, and now everything that I don't like, I'm just like, well, I should just cut part of it off, and that's what I do now. So. This is a men's t-shirt I got on eBay for $8 and took my fabric scissors to. Boom. Wait, let's pull a card for you. Let's Guys, see. I'm a little bit scared right now because okay. the last time Sarah read my card, we did I, 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 I literally had to restart my life. <laughs> like I, I, real, I realized- but That's not that my I, fault. I realized that everything I was doing was almost incorrect or absolutely incorrect. That's not my fault though. That's your fault. So that that uh, don't, don't, that's like I, a it's like a don't kill the messenger type of thing with that. I don't think it was a fault. I'm not blaming anybody. I'm just no, I know. I'm just saying. But like, if you were called to change some shit, like that has nothing to do with me. That has entirely to do with your energy, and your path, right? Like, I'm not the one telling you to do anything. This is higher spiritual energy speaking through me in these cards, telling you to do things, <laughs> and they are calling you on your shit, and that is none of my business. So, so, I'm dead serious. Also, that's not even a joke. That's like you guys are seriousness. in for a treat. I feel like I'm in for a treat. Sarah Landry's really good at reading cards. Watch me pull death again. That would be fucking hysterical. She's practically my favorite witch. Actually, you're my favorite witch. You're the only. I'm the only one you know. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, all right. Okay, we pulled for Jameson. We pulled a ten of wands. A, a, a what of wands? Ten of wands. A ten of wands. Wands, wands like a wand. Oh, a ten of wands. Ten of wands and a uh, four of swords. Okay. This is interesting. Look at the imagery of that. You can hold that for a second. All right, ten of wands. Let's see what she says because this deck's a little bit different. They're all a little bit different. There's a lamp in my card. Okay, ten of wands. Burdens, blockage, difficulty. The Ten of Wands is a difficult card to face. Haha. <laughs> Mental or physical burdens have been weighing on your spirit. Over time, this leads to hopelessness and depression. You simply can't get through to what you want. You cannot see the way. If this card appears in response to a person or situation, it may be best to simply walk away. 
But if this card comes up frequently, it indicates you are attracted to negativity and you choose to walk the hard road. Ooh, call out. Called out. See, I told you. Cosmic call out. I, I, really, I, I'm, I really don't know. I've... Okay, four of swords. Stillness, mental power. The threatening swords loom above. The lamb sits in stillness without fear. The four of swords says it's time to look inward and find the mental power to cope with your pressures. It's important to rest, seek meditation, or find literature that focuses on ways to quiet the mind. Take this time to recuperate and move inward before the swords fall and strike you. See? Called out. That was actually very nice. That was not nearly as scary, as mean as it could have been, unfortunately. This was like... The, I, I the like Ten of Wands is... That's a very... Fu that's fucking hilarious that I pulled that one, though. Because that one... The Ten of Wands is basically like, hey, why are you being negative Nancy? Why are you making your life difficult? So that's a question you should ponder. What am I doing mindset-wise that's getting in my own way? So that's what that means. Sarah, every time I meet with you, I feel that my mind moves into a direction like or like a new positive direction well that's good that's good because i give you a lot of shit so that's very good she gives I'm me so, so much shit. i give him so much shit so much i really shit. do um and we've been friends for not that long but you still get a lot of shit from me but sometimes you deserve it um but yeah um so that's good that's good that means i guess i'm a positive influence see i'm not really a dark person i just look scary right it's like what is it um Trying to think of the animals that are like that, where like they look like a hedgehog, right? Where it like has all the spines, and you're like, "Ooh, I don't know about this." But then they're like, "You." There's like a lot of photos of them oh. taking baths in bathroom sinks, and they're like very cute and sweet on the inside. Oh yeah, yeah. Right, totally. Yeah, they're not. They're not. Yeah, porcupines. I don't think are very. They're they're little. They're little humble creatures. I don't know if they're like inherently aggressive, right? But they just like look dangerous. You know what well, I mean? they 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 have a they have a a a, a spine of protection. Right. All of these like things on the top of a porcupine are so that if, if I'm a dog or a, or a wolf and I want to eat it. Can you imagine that? Like thinking like, oh, a snack and then just getting like a mouthful of spines. That would suck. That would suck. That would suck. That would be horrible. That would be terrible. Sarah, thank you for having us here in your studio today yes. and telling us a little bit about your life, mm -hmm. about your community, about witchcraft and teaching us some things. Yeah, happy to have you guys here. We had a really good time um, filming. So thank you for having me out to play. We had a blast, us and our 12 person. Hopefully very we can have a 12 hundred person party next time. That would be dope. That would be super dope. Um, 2021 goals, scream on top. Yeah, man. Ready for things to be back to back to normal with the touring and live show things. I really miss live shows. Me so too. ready for that. Everybody wear your fucking masks. Serious. Wear your masks. Every time you don't wear a mask, you're preventing your artists that you like from being able to make money from touring. And that is basically the only way that we make money. So think about the artists that you like. And if you truly like and want to support them, please wear your mask. Because the second that this all goes away is the second that all of us actually start to make money again which nobody really is doing right now. So keep that in mind. Spotify doesn't pay shit, so. Thank you, Sarah. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> Creamers, thank you for watching. If you liked this video, give us a thumbs up. If you hated this video, give us a thumbs down. If you like us, subscribe. If you wanna tell us what to do, leave a comment. And if you wanna see what we do, when the lights are out, follow us on Instagram, get creamy.